Welcome, Veritas. I'm excited you're here with us. I've got a cough, so you're going to have to put up with that all night, so I'm sorry. But if you guys are able, let's stand together now. And let's start our time by reading together uh, from Psalm 95. It says this. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. He is a great king above all other gods. The earth, the mountains, and the seas are in his hands. Let us worship and bow down. For we are his people, and he is our creator and our king. Amen. Let's sing now to our great king as we sing with Sarah. When 
our shame that you experienced. We confess to you now the sins that we've committed that are holding you to that cross. the ways we've lived inconsistently with how you want us to live. We confess the ways we've not loved you but abandoned you for something else. Jesus, we know that you willingly took our sin as an act of love. We know that because of your death and resurrection, we are forgiven of our sin and we now have life with you in your kingdom. Amen. in the completed work of cross on the Christ. Christ on the cross offering us forgiveness.
Jesus. There is no one better than him. He bore our sins on his back on the cross that he was placed at so that we could live in a kingdom with him. He gave us eternal life, steadfast love, grace, and mercy. So now we can build our lives with him, for him. Let's keep this in mind, open our hearts and arms as we continue to sing.
you pray with me? Dear God, thank you so much for being so trustworthy. I pray that you would help us to see you as someone that we can trust, someone that we can give everything to. And God, if we've been building our lives on things that haven't been satisfying us, haven't been secure or solid ground, I pray that you would point that out to us and lead us in love back to your grace, back to you, that we would see you as our only solid ground and find our home and our hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You may not know this story, but shameless plug, if you buy John Mark Comer's new book, Live No Lies, you'll get to read more about it in there. It's super fascinating. But in October of 1938, from a small farming town in New Jersey, Carl Phillips broadcasted this chilling report over CBS's national radio waves. He said, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I have ever witnessed. I can see peering out of that black hole two luminous disks. Are they eyes? They might be a face. But this face, this is indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. The eyes are black and gleam like a serpent. The mouth is V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips that seem to quiver and pulsate. There's a jet of flame springing from it, and it is leaping at men that are coming towards it. It's striking them head on. They're turning into flames. The whole field, it's on fire. The woods, the barns, the cars, the fire, it's spreading everywhere. And it was at this point that Philip's voice cut out pretty abruptly and it was followed by a few seconds of silent radio hiss. A few seconds later after this, another news anchor came in with reports of, the sim of similar findings in St. Louis and Chicago. And a few seconds after that, listeners gawked at their radios as a news anchor confirmed no less than our greater, greatest fear, that aliens had invaded the United States. The National Guard was called in. Bells rang in Manhattan to evacuate. People fled the cities. Pregnant women went into labor early. People committed suicide. Looting broke out in the streets. There was a news article that went out the next day about a woman who allegedly ran into a church prayer meeting and like interrupted it and yelled that New York had fallen, that you might as well go home where you can die peacefully. The world is ending. Now, before I go any further, so we all don't think that I like legitimately believe aliens landed in multiple cities across the United States in 1938. We somehow forgot about it as a society. No, I don't believe that. But um, everything that I just described to you besides that really did happen. Here's the real backstory. So Orson Welles, at the time, he was a young, like aspiring actor and director of a new radio program on CBS. And remember, this was 1938, so this was well before TV, and this was the beginning of entertainment as we kind of know it now. And so imagine families gathered around their living rooms, surrounded by their radios um, on a nightly like, kind of routine, just flipping the dial to hear whatever the newest show or news was that night. And this particular night, this was the first airing of an hour-long adaptation of The War of the Worlds. Maybe that sounds familiar now. And they updated details and they set it right in the US at the time, at the time, 1938. And this was the first of its kind. And, but this, because it was the first of its kind, this radio show, it wasn't that popular yet. Most people, they didn't like turn their dial on right at eight to listen to this program. But as far as we know, a really popular radio show ended at 8.15 p.m. And so this particular night at 8.16, Masses of people across the United States turned their dial to a new channel only to hear what appeared to be these like really realistic news reports of alien invasion mayhem in the United States. And it included an emergency broadcast from an actor whose voice really closely resembled the sitting presidents at the time. People legitimately like freaked out. What I described earlier really happened. People stormed churches, they looted the streets, fled from their cities. There are legitimate reports and like news articles written the day after of people who were wishing to die because they genuinely believed that the world was over. People lost their minds. 
Why do I tell you this? Because in telling you this story, there's kind of a few ways we see here that key details change the whole meaning of the story. For the original audience in 1938 who didn't know that this was a fictional entertainment radio show, they legitimately thought the world was coming to an end because of the message that they had heard. And tonight, I started by kind of leaving out some pretty key details, you know, like the whole alien invasion thing not being a real thing, which hopefully you didn't really buy into that. But while most of what I told you was true, not telling you that pretty key detail, it changed the whole meaning of the story. And so tonight, we're starting a new sermon series in the book of Galatians. And the Christians that Paul is writing to in Galatia, they had heard the message of Jesus, but other people had come through after and changed with some, or messed with some key details. And they changed the meaning of the story. They had um, the Galatians kind of just questioning, like, the message that they had been told. Was the good news really good news? So tonight, we're going to set up the book of Galatians, and we're going to zoom in to the first chapter, which kind of sets this, like, umbrella for the rest of our talks this semester in Galatians. We'll look at how the Galatian church, they were being pulled away from the one true gospel and how we are tempted to do the same. Okay, so let's start with the first chapter of the book of Galatians. If you're new to reading your Bibles, the Bible is, isn't just one book, but it's actually a library of books spanning thousands of years, and they give us this glimpse into God's story that he's telling throughout the course of humanity, and it all points to Jesus. And so Galatians is a letter, and it's in the New Testament, which is the part of the Bible that was written after Jesus. Um, and Galatians was written about 48 AD. It's written by a guy named Paul, um, who, Paul was a Roman citizen at the time, and he was also part of a pretty legalistic sect of Judaism called, like, you might have heard the word Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee, and he, Paul was known for his persecution, his hate, imprisonment, and even killing of Christians. That was until he encountered the risen Jesus. And it changed his life so much that he devoted his whole life to the very cause he tried to stop. He went on to be a missionary, a leader in the early church, and the author of most of the books in our New Testament, including Galatians, what we're going to read tonight. So Galatians was written by Paul to the churches in Galatia. So it appears that Paul had been in Galatia before. Um, he had likely shared with them the message of Jesus. Um, but after he had come, some missionaries, likely Jewish Christians, had come in after and started messing with some key details. And so let's pick up in Galatians 1. 1, you can read along on the screen. It starts with Paul, an apostle. I'm already going to pause. So an apostle um, is a word for a messenger, someone that, who has been entrusted with a message from a person um, and with a mission. And so in our case, an apostle is someone who has seen Christ or the risen Christ in Paul's case, and he has been sent by him with a message. And so he goes on, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men or by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we have preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. So Paul's like wasting no time in here. He's like coming in hot. Um, first thing, he's astonished. So we aren't always given these like strong emotive words in the Bible. And so I just want to draw attention to that. Paul here, he is astonished. He is shocked. And he's shocked 
um, because the Galatians are turning to a different gospel, which Paul says is no gospel at all. Now, I want to pause here. This word gospel, it means good news. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, it could mean one of two things. One, the gospel, it could mean the establishment of a king or the reign of a king. Or two, gospel could mean when a victory had occurred. News would spread about the victory won on the people's behalf, and it would be called gospel because it was good news for the people. And if you've been around the church for a while, um, you've probably heard it in reference to the story of Jesus, the gospel or the good news that Jesus is the saving king. You see, this idea of a saving king, this was long awaited. We see over and over again in the Old Testament the promise of a king who would bring good news to God's people. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, proclaim peace, bring good tidings, proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Or in Isaiah 61, 1, When it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release darkness from the prisoners. And so, enter Jesus, whose birth created a stir when the Magi came from far away and said, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? And Jesus, who started his ministry by announcing the good news, that the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news in Mark 1.15. He is the good news. But this king of the Jews, he was born a refugee, born in a manger to a lower class family in a town that no one cared about. Instead of this militant political ruler who reigned by conquering nations, he reigned by serving others, healing the sick, washing people's feet, Jesus, this king, he was mocked, beaten, and hung on a a cross between two criminals. As his enthronement as king, he was clothed with a robe and given a crown of thorns and a sign that hung above his head that said, King of the Jews. And in dying, he saved us, you and me, from ourselves, from our sin, from the world's brokenness. He was crushed for our iniquities, and by his wounds, we have been healed. And on the third day, our King Jesus, he rose from the dead. If the crucifixion was his enthronement as king, his resurrection showed the power of his reign. The gospel is simple. Jesus is the saving king. And through his death and resurrection, the powers of sin and evil at work in this world no longer have the last word. That, that gospel is what Paul is reminding people of in verses 3 and 4 when he says, The Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Paul here is reminding the Galatians of the gospel, of the good news. But in verses 6 and 7, we learn that the Galatians, they have been turning away from the gospel. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. So some backstory here. Christianity, as we know it, began as like a Jewish messianic movement in Jerusalem. But God's plan was much, was much bigger than for just them, and it was for all of humanity. And so quickly, this movement, it spread beyond just Israel. And by Paul's time, there was as many non-Jews as there were Jews in the Jesus movement. And this sparked a huge debate among Christians in the day. Historically, the people of God, they were focused in on one ethnic group. They were set apart by practices outlined in the Torah, like the practice of circumcision and, pra- and maintaining food laws, like kosher food laws. And there were many Jewish Christians at the day during this time that believed that all of these non-Jews who wanted to be converted into the Jesus way, they had to be circumcised and they had to obey the laws of the Torah. In other words, they were saying that what Jesus did was not enough. They were adding to his gospel, which Paul says is no gospel at all. 
They were tweaking it, which just like how I told you the War of the World story at the beginning, um, that changed the whole meaning of the story. And if we're not careful, we can fall into the same sort of trap the church in Galatia did. We not, might not be asking people if they're following what food laws or if you're wearing mixed fabric in your clothing. But we can look at our life and say, because I go to church or because I go to Veritas or serve in this way or was nice to this person or did this good and right thing, then I am a good Christian. Or we can look at someone in our life and say that because they do A, B, C, they probably don't care about God. Or we can sit in the silence and shame about our past, about something that we did or are currently struggling with. We can convince ourselves that if people really knew the depths of what I've done, I wouldn't be welcomed here. Or maybe if you're just being honest with yourself, time with Jesus comes second to studying, to class, work. What you do takes precedent in your daily life. And with this worldview, this like gospel, it can essentially boil down to this. If I'm a good person, I'm in a right standing with God. Or being a Christian just means doing the right things. Have you heard that before? Maybe if you're being honest with yourself, maybe that's what you deep down believe. But I'm going to be real with you guys. That sounds a lot more like the plot of The Good Place and way less like the story of the Bible. I don't know if you've watched The Good Place, and so I won't ruin any of the many plot twists that are in it. Um, But the um, initial plot is that it's about a woman, Kristen Bell, who dies, and she gets to The Good Place, which is basically this, like, highly selective, heaven-like utopia reserved for only the best of the best. And you only get in for being a good person in your time on Earth. And they know whether or not you're this good person by their point system. And so basically, they, you get positive or negative points based off of how much good or bad you put into the universe. You could get just some of like the points things, because I think they're hilarious. But you could get almost 10,000 points for not discussing veganism unprompted, while only 500 points for being vegan. I'll let you do that math. Um, 17.78 points for helping a hermit crab find its shell, and 31.57 points for attending a cousin's friend's jazz dance recital. You also got, in the negative side, negative 1.44 points for blowing your nose in public, negative 40 points for overstating a personal connection to a tragedy that has nothing to do with you, negative 65 points for revving your car engine unnecessarily, And negative 99.15 points for rooting for the New York Yankees. Feels a little pointed. The show is so funny. It's one of my favorites. Um, And the specificity of, like, what points put you where to show, like, the wit um, of the writers in the writer's room. But more than just, like, wit and cleverness, I think much deeper, I think the good place and their point system, this put such an honest, like, an interesting look at the human experience. Because who can really put a score on how good of a person you are? And yet, we fall into that trap all the time. And what this does to the gospel, it does the same thing that I did with you with the War of the World story. It changes the whole meaning of it. Because if the good news is that I have to be a good person to get to the good place, why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? Later in the book of Galatians, Paul tells us in in verse 2, 16, he says, We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. So this word justified, it like comes up a bunch in that. Um, but to justify, to be justified is to be made in a right relationship with God. And so Paul is super clear in these verses. There is no amount of human effort that can truly justify us, that can put us in right relationship with God. And that's because the good news, the gospel, for us is not about us. It is for us, but it's not about us. 
It's about Jesus and it has everything to do with us. You see, going back to the church in Galatia, the Jewish Christians, their good news was that Jesus is the saving king. Like, they did not disagree about that fact. But they also believed that people had to do X, Y, and Z in order for him to save them. But Jesus' good news is that he is a saving king, period. And by an act of his grace, we get to enter into that kingdom and enact that kingdom here and now. The Jewish Christians, their good news makes it all about me. But Jesus' good news lets us enter a story that is much bigger than ourselves. It's not just about me, but about what Jesus did and is doing in the world. The Jewish Christians, their gospel put a wall up for people to have to climb over by their own will. But Jesus' gospel tears that wall down. Jesus' gospel is for all people and all nations and for all of the world. So to end, I kind of wanted to zoom in on this one word that Paul repeats over and over again, and that word is faith. We just read Paul, who said that we are not justified by the works of the law. We cannot be in right relationship with God by purely what we do, but only by faith in Jesus. And so what does it mean to have faith in Jesus? My guess is, if I were to ask some of you what faith means, I think a lot of you would probably tell me that faith is a mental mindset or an emotional state. Maybe it's just an optimism about the future or a positive mindset. Or maybe for some of you, imagery comes to mind, like making a blind leap or taking a step on a staircase when you can't totally see the end of it. Or maybe for some of you, you think faith is just believing without any sort of evidence, or that faith is just the opposite of reason. We have to remember this word faith, it didn't exist in the time of Jesus. No one in Jesus' day talked about faith in Jesus. They spoke in a different language. They had completely different culture and time and connotations and attachments to this word faith. And so in the original language of the Bible, they used the word pistis for faith. And this word, it doesn't totally translate into our modern understanding of faith. It's actually a lot more embodied and outward facing than what we usually think about with faith. It's a lot closer to our word allegiance. And so allegiance, by definition, is a whole life loyalty to a person or a cause. And so, in our case, allegiance to Jesus is expressed through our whole life commitment, which inherently means that we're revoking all other allegiances and living a life that looks more and more like Jesus. A whole life loyalty and a whole self-commitment to Jesus the King. Paul gets this. Later in the book, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, or pistis, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When we live our lives by faith in Jesus and in the gospel that Jesus is the saving king, what's true of him becomes true of us. The true gospel, it transforms us by a continual daily turning from our sin and towards Jesus. He, while slowly and over time, he starts to reorient our hearts and our lives and our desires towards him. And from that regular bringing our sins before God, we get to literally experience the forgiveness and grace of God on a daily basis. Later in this series, we're gonna look at how the gospel brings true freedom in our lives. How through the power of the Holy Spirit, it grows us into people who look more and more like our King Jesus. And how this gospel enables us to love and care for one another in the way that we were created to. And this gospel, this gospel is good news for the world. Education, social reform, medicine, democracy, the arts, and modern science, the modern values like equality, love, and freedom, all of these root their current existence to the teaching of the followers of Jesus. 
And that's because Jesus' gospel is good news. And so as the music team comes back up, I'd like to just kind of invite you guys to bow your heads. Um, I just want to invite you to reflect on the way that you have been viewing the gospel. The way that you have been living into the gospel. Are there any key details missing or added on that have changed the message or the story that you're living into? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for Jesus, um, our King. I thank you for the beauty um, of the gospel. I pray that we would, that you would just open our eyes to your gospel, your good news in new, um, in new ways. I pray that your gospel would um, transform us, that it would transform our daily life. I pray that we would live our lives um, true to the gospel and that through living our lives true to the gospel, that you would use us in our communities, um, in our friendships, God, in our classes, in our sororities and fraternities, in our dorms. I just pray that you would uh, transform us by the power of your gospel and that your gospel would just transform um, the world around us. Um, I just thank you for your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, will you stand with us and let's keep worshiping.
Lord Jesus, uh, we thank you for what you have done, for the story that you are telling in our lives, that you have been telling since the beginning. Um, Lord, that you have always wanted to be with us, to save us, to bring us back to you. Um, Lord, we thank you um, for who you are. I pray um, that you would continue to shape our hearts, um, to love you and to live into that story each day. Pray this all in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus, I thank you for things like passion and for the ways that you have used passion over the last however many years that passion has been a thing. And, and I pray that this moment, that this conference, really this experience of, of bringing tens of thousands of college students together to worship you, I pray that it wouldn't just be a moment, it wouldn't just be something powerful, it wouldn't just even be an experience, but it would be a, a time of worshiping you, seeing you more clearly, learning about you, leaning into the gospel, leaning into that good news, learning more and more, Jesus, that you are more. Help us, help those that are there, help us to believe that. We want that to be true, Jesus, and we know that you use things like passion powerfully in our lives and in the lives of countless others, and so we pray that that would happen this year at Passion. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, why don't you guys stand, uh, and I'll leave you with this blessing from Emily's talk. Would God give you the eyes to see the beauty and the splendor and the glory of Jesus, that we would believe more and more the good news that Jesus is King, and that we wouldn't be distracted, that we wouldn't be lured into believing false gospels, which are really no gospel at all but that more and more we would want and live for King Jesus. Amen. Thanks for coming.